something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, so, a quick intro um, of myself. I'm Helen McLaughlin. I'm currently an information security architect at Workday, which is a, a SaaS provider for um, HCM and financial management software. I've got um, over 15 years um, experience in IT, so I've worked on a number of different types of, of projects, so software development and integration, as well as managing a sort of global business application support team. Um, and I guess, yeah, I wanted to come and yeah, share some of the insights that, that I've had um, yeah, from my work experience, really. Um, the first thing is talking about the trends. So I, th I think this is, uh, yeah, everybody knows this, the consensus is that SaaS uh, adoption is accelerating. It's here to stay. Um, you've got various uh, different uh, market research bodies. So you've got Gartner, Forrester, you've got people who are you know, investing in technology. So you've got, you know, got the investment banks, Goldman Sachs and so on, as well as solution integrators that do all of their market research, trying to predict the future. And really what they all come up with is that cloud adoption is accelerating. Um, SaaS is going to be outstripping the growth of infrastructure as a service and platforms as a service. Um, and the, the most important focus uh, is going to be around you know, security in the cloud as well as the mobile uh, applications. So KPMG do a report every year where they're looking at enabling business in the cloud and they're looking at uh, yeah, the, the different concerns from the, the IT execs that are responding. And what has become uh, most important more recently is the issue of data loss and privacy risks, as well as the risk as in, of intellectual property theft. This more so uh, than looking at you know, how your IT organization is going to be impacted, the return on investment, the features, functionality, and so on. And, and it's very real. The other trend is that there's a greater awareness amongst executives uh, about security risks because they're now in the newspapers. I mean, these, um, yeah, there's a few examples here. You have, have Heartbleed, which was uh, uh, you know, a vulnerability in the protocol, uh, the TLS protocol, which I think most, most companies uh, heard about because that was uh, in, the, in the papers back in April last year. And then Sony, another which was actually, they think it's an insider threat where somebody has you know, gone after content in order to embarrass and you know, damage the reputation and obviously share price of Sony. You've also got things that are, uh, yeah, the brute force attacks on the iCloud, so the, the posting of private pictures and so on, um, which I think everybody's aware of. And then the other, uh, another example would be a malware attack where we had um, the largest, um, the largest um, uh, credit card theft, actually, in history. It was 70 million credit card details were taken. Um, malware was installed on servers inside Target. They had around 1,800 um, points of sale. Uh, or uh, yeah, shops, points of service, and they, um, yeah, th they were routing all of those credit card details somewhere in Eastern Europe. Uh, now, 70 million, that's one in three. One in three of the American population was actually impacted um, by such an event. And these are now in the newspapers, so whether it's in the US uh, or, or over in Europe, people are now aware, and nobody actually, you know, nobody wants their company name put next to, uh, you know, an event like this. So what, when you're looking to move to the cloud, assuming that's the trend, what is it that, that people are looking for? They're looking to ensure that you know, security is a priority as well as data privacy uh, being a priority, which, um, yeah, make, makes perfect sense. So is it valid that you've got these concerns? Uh, and I'd say, um, yeah, with the new paradigm that we have with you know, moving to the cloud, the thing I would also say is that We've always, well, for the last couple of decades, we've been outsourcing business processes. So it's not new. If you think payroll, we've been outsourcing payroll for yeah, 20 years. Recruitment as well. It's rare that the HR functions actually are doing you know, a lot of their own recruitment and managing that process like background screening, uh, you know, um, looking at um, yeah, education background, employment history, criminal background checks, and so on. That's, a lot of that process is now outsourced, as well as accounting. So the, the, you know, the, the putting together of your financial reports and so on is often done by an external company, as well as IT support. So most of us are calling and, and dealing with third parties, um, whichever one of the, you know, the, the major players it is. 
when you're calling about your issues with your, with your help desk, they're often um, you know, external employees uh, outsourced. And call centers, of course, whether you're dealing with your bank, often you're routed to the Philippines or to India or somewhere uh, where they're providing services around the clock. So it's not new, it's not unique. And I guess the, the, the thing here is, is that, um, yeah, w when executives see, you know, talk of the cloud and, and putting their data in the cloud, um, they're actually doing that already. They're already putting their data with another par party when they're outsourcing their business processes. So it's not new. It's more, uh, yeah, it, it's a fear that we, need to, that we need to overcome. And the other one, um, the other one is sort of international transfers of data. So there are also concerns about where your cloud provider may be based and where your data may be hosted. And this seems to come up a lot because um, there are questions about who can access what from where. And again, this actually is not a new problem. If you think about it, actually email is probably the biggest um, or the, the least secure um, application and method of transferring data that we've got. You have very little control over what is attached in there, the content, the data, the Excel files, you know, with everybody's salary details, whatever it is. Um, yeah, so, so we've been transferring data across borders already when we're dealing with suppliers, with affiliates, with other offices as part of our company. And the reason why is because data is needed in those places. So it's a requirement. It's needed. It's necessary. And we do it today. So moving to the cloud isn't going to affect that. So it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a new consideration. So what should we be doing? We should be, uh, we should be looking towards assurance. How are you going to get assurance when you're working uh, with cloud service providers and, and specifically uh, software as a service? Now, this is, a, this is an interesting one. So first of all, regulatory compliance. And I think the first thing when you're looking to outsource different uh, types of business applications, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look at, you know, what is your industry and what are the regulations for your industry? What is your core business? Are these, um, are these things that you want to outsource or can you? Can you regulatory and legally do that? So if you're a, a defense contractor, so you're Rolls-Royce or BAE Systems, would you really want to be outsourcing systems that are hosting your you know, confidential information that is about your, um, yeah, your, the secrets uh, of all of the designs of, of whatever it is that you're manufacturing? Probably not. If you're a financial services company, would you be outsourcing your, you know, the, the transaction systems and the credit and market risk systems? Probably not. You know, asset and liability management and so on. All of the things are core banking activities. You would not be looking to outsource those. And from a regulatory perspective as well, that would be really difficult. The same with pharmaceuticals. If you're developing drugs, there are certain regulations and rules about you know, the controls that need to be in place for that. So it's important to understand what the regulatory environment is for, for your particular uh, company and make decisions on what is appropriate to be actually outsourced. It's clear, I think, uh, office is usually uh, you know, office infrastructure. When I say office, I mean your email, your file services, your SharePoint, you know, whatever it is that's sort of supporting um, your office activities. Those are usually the first to be outsourced. And you see a large uptake, I think, of Microsoft th uh, Office 365 by Microsoft, which is uh, a software as a service. And actually, in, my, um, yeah, my, in the last year that I've, of work, uh, Workday, we see that actually Office 365 is one of the first um, cloud service providers that companies have gone with. So they've, they've already you know, started to, to cut new ground with, with, with how to deal with that within their companies. The other thing as well, so going back to the transfer of data across borders, the other thing to account for and understand is what are the privacy regulations that are relevant to you. Um, so in, if you talk in terms of the uh, data uh, protection regulation in Europe, which is, is quite strong, you have a couple of uh, entities. You've got a data controller and a data processor. Your data controller is really is, is the customer in this scenario. So it's, it's you, and when you're, you, well, yeah, you are the data owner, the data controller. You're responsible to make sure that you are meeting the obligations of regulation. You're responsible for compliance. When you move towards a, a, a SaaS provider, you do not outsource that responsibility. You do not transfer the risk, uh, you know, and responsibility to another party. You're still the one who's accountable and responsible for regulation. So it's important to know. Um, yeah, and you'll see, you'll see this reflected in the contracts as well with SaaS providers. So it's important to understand, you know, 
what is it that my, well, where are my jurisdictions that I'm doing business? What are the uh, privacy requirements and, and, you know, in those locations? Who can access what data from where? Who can view what? Who can action what on what data? And this is, yeah, it's not only in, in choosing a provider that can actually allow you to uh, restrict access between, uh, you, you know, different locations, for example, but also make sure that the contract is represented uh, adequately. Um, as well as, uh, yeah, during deployment, you need to make sure that this is, this is done well. So it's important to consult the different functions within your organization, your compliance and your legal counsel, when you are selecting a vendor to make sure that they can provide a service that will allow you to meet your uh, regulatory uh, requirements. And also in contract negotiations, as well as solution design. Um, what I've seen uh, in, in, you know, in, in experience is that a lot of uh, technology departments go ahead with decision making for uh, a certain SaaS provider and actually forget this part. And they come in much later in the process, which can actually delay everything. If you're sort of project oriented and looking towards a you know, delivery date by a certain time, you can actually get unstuck if you don't involve these people early in the process. So you need to make sure that what you're, yeah, that what you're transitioning towards with whichever uh, business service that you're outsourcing, you need to make sure that it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's compliant. And then the other thing as well is the regulatory environment obviously changes. It doesn't change quickly. To put new laws in place takes you know, several years of, of rounds of discussion and negotiation. If we look at the, I think, data protection regulation in Europe is due to be uh, overhauled, and we're expecting the European Commission to announce that shortly uh, this year, in fact, this month. And then they're going to have a couple of years to, uh, to comply with it. But it's important, whether it's a privacy or whether it's a compliance for your particular industry, you need to keep abreast of what those changes are and how to evolve and continuously ensure that you can still be compliant. So it's, yeah, it's new mechanisms that need to be put in place, essentially. Another aspect as well, so when you're looking at a, a provider, it's great to take their word that everything that they do is, is done well, but really you should um, yeah, trust them, of course, but also verify. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. Um, any um, SaaS provider um, that, is, that is doing business and, and, you know, well and successfully, they should have a host of different uh, third-party audit reports that you can actually review. I think most people will be familiar with some of the content of these, but I'll just run through, uh, through them. So the first would be the ISO 27001, which is a, uh, it's about your information security management system. And it's got you know, everything from compliance and legal about how you recruit, look at backgrounds, uh, you know, background screening and checking of uh, qualifications and employment history, credit checks, whatever might be relevant. It also goes through software development and the controls around that all the way through to you know, uh, business continuity planning, disaster recovery, monitoring, etc. There's about 13 different categories. What's important to know as well with your ISO, you have actually a statement of applicability. So it could be that a provider decides what they think are the relevant controls that they should be um, you know, meeting. You need to look carefully at what the design of those controls is. So do they cover all of the aspects that are important uh, and should be in there, and that's something that should take place as part of a negotiation before you sign any contracts. <coughs> the next one um, is the, so you've got the SSAE 16 SOC 1 and SOC 2 reports. These replaced the SAS 70 back in, I think it was June 2011, and we've also got the international standard, um, the, the 3042 audit, which is actually uh, yeah, the same as the SOC 1, more or less. And these are, so you've got the SOC 1, which is around your financial, uh, sorry, controls around, um, yeah, your, for your financial reporting. So it would be the equivalent of your SOC 404. Um, and then your SOC 2 uh, is about your information security controls for a service organization. So looking at the content of these reports, and having, having gone through a few of these, they can be, uh, yeah, they can be a couple of, or a few hundred pages long. So it's pretty dry uh, content, maybe good uh, uh, material for just before bed. But um, yeah, it, it's important to look at the content of these and make sure that they're complete. You get your socks every six months and you get your socks, uh, well, your sock one every six months and your sock two every, uh, every 12 months. So it's important as well that you, you not only have the first view of these before you work with a provider, but you also then have some mechanism to have somebody to continuously review these. Deltas, for example, between the different reports of different years. Check what is new, check what has evolved, see how they've changed their service and the controls. Um, the next one was about the safe harbor. So this is, um, this is about the uh, adequacy um, of, of controls around um, personal data. 
So with the uh, data protection regulation, they talk about uh, personally identifiable information or information that can identify a natural living person. And in Europe, and uh, the European Economic Area in Switzerland, we have quite stringent uh, controls. And if you're going to be outsourcing with uh, you know, a company that has got support functions in other countries, you need to be aware of which countries those are and make sure that there's some sort of adequacy agreement. So Safe Harbor is the one that the US government have. Uh, it's a program they set up to ensure that they have you know, an adequate level of controls. And any provider should have a registration with the Chamber of Commerce for this. And then there's reciprocal, reciprocal, reciprocal agreements uh, with other countries as well. So these are things to look for to make sure that you know who is going to be accessing your data from where and have they, they got adequacy uh, in terms of privacy uh, protection. And then Trust eCloud privacy certification is another uh, example um, of certifications that you can look at which demonstrate um, yeah, high standards. Another way of comparing, so it depends, um, so benchmarking of the different SaaS providers. So you may have a number of different providers uh, that you're looking at. And it, depending on how mature your own risk assessment process is, you, you may want to look towards uh, things like the bit shared assessment, shared information gathering questionnaire, or the Cloud Security Alliance CSA start uh, self-assessment. What these are, are well, the, the two different bodies here uh, independently, they have got together and agreed on what a baseline set of controls should be in order to allow you to compare cloud providers. And this is, um, yeah, this is a good one because you're, you're, uh, yeah, it, it could be a way of actually checking whether your risk assessment process is comprehensive by comparing your own to this or even taking this as your lead and getting any providers to complete these so that you can actually compare uh, like with like. Now, SaaS providers, um, there's a few differentiators. So the benefits of um, obviously going with a SaaS provider over doing it in-house, one of the key things would be um, you know, a dedicated security organization and governance. It's core business to a SaaS provider. If you're not keeping the data secure, you know, you don't have a business essentially. So they actually invest heavily. So you could, uh, yeah, what you'd be looking for is to make sure that a SaaS provider has a, you know, a comprehensive organization that is supporting not only, uh, you know, guidelines on design and development and testing and promotion to pr production of all of your code, as well as a, a, an effectively managed security operating center. And you'd want to understand about their incident handling processes. How does that work? What is the notification uh, if there's any breach or if there's a security incident that could affect you? These are the, th these are the um, yeah, th they're going to be doing it well. They're going to be doing it following best practice. Uh, and they're going to do be doing it sort of, you know, at a high standard. So it's worth, um, yeah, investing the time to really dig into the details of what it is and how they're actually managing um, uh, their, their organization. There's another aspect as well. So a lot of the, uh, the, SaaS providers tend to be newer players on the market or a new part of an existing sort of older uh, incumbent. And what you'll find is, is that they are usually, because they, they maybe don't have legacy, um, they have not come from uh, a history of perhaps uh, being, you know, relational databases. They're using uh, more modern technologies that are built for cloud. So if you look at LinkedIn, if you look at um, uh, Google or uh, Facebook, as examples, um, they're using object-oriented uh, design um, in, their, in their databases, and it's built for cloud. You then get additional features which you cannot get with relational databases uh, without a lot more uh, overhead in processing or cost for storage. So things like always-on auditing. These are um, yeah, key features that you would want when you're outsourcing as well, because you want to make sure that you know who has accessed or viewed anything at any one time, whether it's on the infra layer, application layer, and so on. As well, the other aspect is uh, encryption. So encryption of all of your data at rest, all of your data in transit. Um, going back to this example of uh, you know, relational databases, it's very difficult to encrypt all of your information uh, in your database on the fly without having a massive performance overhead. And I think with the newer technologies in the SaaS marketplace, they're not, they, yeah, they, can, they can really encrypt on the fly because of how they've deployed their object-oriented data model. And the other aspect as well, um, you're going to find that usually these are highly customizable, uh, sorry, highly configurable uh, rather than customizable. So um, if you've got on-premise software, 
and you are you know, making your changes, usually it's a large um, development project and integration project to, to bolt on any changes that, or additions that you want to, 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 to put on there. And it's actually, um, yeah, you, you should be looking for something that is configurable, highly configurable, uh, that allows you to uh, yeah, more strictly apply whatever your policies are for things like uh, access, user access control. Another thing um, as well, if you're looking for a SaaS provider that often have built, well, SaaS, true SaaS is multi-tenanted um, and it's built off a single code line. When you have that, you have a single uh, security model. You may have some providers that actually call themselves SaaS, but what they are is a number of um, uh, acquisitions where they have put together a portal with then several um, databases and uh, modules, if you like, sat behind it. So you're going to have a different security model applied to each of those, rather than in true SaaS where you have a single code line and a single um, security model, you've actually only got one place to apply all of your, um, your security, which is, um, yeah, which is key. The next one as well then is the, um, yeah, and stricter access control for support functions. So again, going back to, um, yeah, who can access your data from where? You want to make sure that you don't have data breaches. And um, yeah, they're going to have this uh, yeah, more, more tightly tied down. Again, going back to the uh, you know, our current uh, on-premise environment, you often have a sysadmin or a DBA who can log directly onto any box and they can usually read everything in clear text of what is on there in the database. With uh, you know, the newer technologies where you've actually you're, you've been able to encrypt everything uh, that is in your persistent store, you ha can have all of your infra support uh, functions log on, but they actually can't read it because it's all encrypted. So these are, um, yeah, these are key. The next one as well is the, obviously if you've got application support, making sure that everything is logged. And you should have the facility to be able to integrate all of their application logging uh, from the cloud provider with your own security uh, information and event monitoring solution. So these are, these are key things that you should be looking for. So the changing focus of IT. So if I look at um, yeah, the, the way that things seem to be evolving from what I can see, it's less about the control over physical assets. I think there's an initial um, concern or fear with taking, uh, you know, taking your, your, your applications and putting them in the cloud, not being able to look at them physically in a data center. I think if you tie it back to the slides about um, you know, where we saw Sony and the iCloud um, and the Target uh, incidents, um, these were not uh, attacks that had happened because people had accessed the physical kit. It's not about physical access to your server environments that are hosting your applications. It's actually uh, more important uh, about the logical access and how you control and limit who has logical access to your information and your data. So, um, yeah, with this in mind, once we get over that, let's say, fear or concern um, of, of moving to the cloud, what we then have is a new way of looking at technology, which is actually about the framework um, of attestations and assurance from, uh, from audit to make sure that you have got end-to-end -end compliance across your entire um, you know, technology stack or, or, or business process. So what this means, if you've got all of these, uh, yeah, you, you've essentially got to come up with your, your new governance framework of how that's going to work within your company. And what this means is, is you possibly need to look at the way that your policies are currently defined. So do you have a policy for how you assess a cloud provider in the first place? Do you have a policy of how you should be, you know, what, what are the standards that you should be assessing them, uh, doing the risk assessment? How do you make sure, you know, the ongoing mo monitoring and maintenance? Which roles are going to be doing that? So the roles and responsibilities as well of the different IT functions is going to evolve. And I think, yeah, that's, it's clear today. And I think, um, yeah, I see, I see it when we're doing the contract negotiations. Uh, with, with new customers, the fact that it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a new paradigm and a new way of working. Not only that, I think with a SaaS provider, you um, previously, uh, with, when you were buying software, it would be a contract with a vendor and you'd be able to define all of your own terms and conditions. Whereas in the new paradigm, it's often as well a one-to-many model. So you have a single set of contract terms 
it's not possible to incorporate your own security controls or objectives or terms and conditions into those SaaS contracts because it breaks the one-to-many model. And for that reason, then, you, you are really, it's a subscriber model rather than, you know, a, a contract that is with, with a vendor where you can have whatever you like in it. And that actually means that you, per SaaS provider, you have to adapt um, your roles and, uh, yeah, your, your roles in order to, to, to basically fulfill whatever output of information is coming and, and keep, keep it all in order to make sure that you're compliant so that you can report back to your, your auditors. I think I'm going a bit, bit quicker than I intended. But, um, yeah, the key takeaways then are um, SAS is here to stay. I don't think anybody uh, disagrees with that statement. Um, it, it's, um, yeah, it's growing. It's going to grow. There's a, a lot of benefits around doing it. And nobody wants to have a data breach. Uh, that's the most important thing. Nobody, uh, no executive of any sort wants to make a decision and have their company name tied to the fact that there was a breach with, with whichever cloud service provider that they've gone with. Um, yeah, getting over the fear of actually outsourcing once again. So the challenges aren't new. We've been doing this for, um, yeah, for decades actually with all the different business processes uh, that we've outsourced. And understanding the requirements, what can you, what, can, what, would you, uh, what would you not outsource, what would you outsource, um, and making sure that you're meeting all of your regulatory uh, compliance as well as business objectives. And then your governance and monitoring framework uh, needs to be looked at, um, as well as you know, incorporating whatever output the SaaS provider has, so all of the different reports that we were talking about that come with a regular frequency, whether it's half a, half a year, or, or every year, um, you need to make sure that your governance uh, and, and, and monitoring framework is incorporating those. Not only that, making sure that you're getting in the feeds from compliance and legal for anything that might be changing and how you need to adapt your solution. The changes in the controls from the SaaS provider, making sure that you're continuously doing a risk assessment to make sure that it's, it's still meeting your requirements. And again, reviewing your policies and your roles and your responsibilities because they actually, they are going to change. You're going to be managing uh, you know, the negotiation of contracts, as well as engaging the different roles, such as your information security, your risk assessment folks, compliance, legal, procurement as well, need to change the way that they think when you're dealing with these different one-to-many contracts. So that was what I wanted to talk to you about. And, uh, yeah, I want to invite questions if anybody has any. Um, not necessarily. I think you've, oh, sorry. So I think to summarize the question, I think you've got a larger attack surface when you've got multiple SaaS providers. Yeah, it's opposite to doing like on-premise. Right, so the perception is, is that if you've got on-premise, you've got better control and security over something that is, uh, let's say, multiple SaaS providers that you've integrated as your solution. Um, now, let me think. So what would the, the most important thing here is, um, yeah, you, you're equating on-premise as in physically having it uh, in your own environment as being more secure than being in the cloud, which I don't think is necessarily... Yeah, I guess you do. You do have an increased attack service when you've got more SaaS providers. Um, but then again, you, you, yeah, you, 
in fact, you'd probably want information about the volumes of, uh, of security incidents that they may, may have, but I don't believe any SAS organization would actually share that with you, so it's really difficult to get that sort of insight. I think the key question is, um, is how many data breaches have they had um, in, in, a, in a period of time? That, I think, is the most important one because that's actually what you're interested in, is protecting your data. Um, and really, then I would go back to the contracts and make sure that during breach, uh, if there was a breach, what are the provisions in the contract for that? So you're going to have liability insurance uh, of sorts and sort of you know, how to rectify that situation, whether it's setting up an organization in order to contact all the people whose data has been breached, maybe even if it's uh, identity theft or... I think SAS, you should expect a higher level of service from a SAS provider, absolutely, without a doubt. And I think um, during your assessment, you would hope to find that that is actually the case. And in, as well, it's a risk-based assessment, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to be putting your core business um, assets out to those providers. You're only going to be, uh, you, you're going to look at uh, the classification of your data. So the, the lowest classification, perhaps, is where you start which often is uh, HR or financial type data. So there's two parts to that. One is about the liability question. Yeah, and forensic then, would you actually and is forensics any good? And again, this should all be part of your contract negotiations. So I think um, with the liability question, so if you take um, data privacy uh, as an example, so if you've got uh, your own employees' data that you're outsourcing, and it's HR as an example, um, you as the data controller have... have informed that data subject of why you're collecting the data and how you're going to process it and for what purpose and so on. So all of the, the, the seven principles. Under European currency, European directive. Yeah, so I'm using Europe as an example. Um, so if there is a, um, uh, yeah, so if you're outsourcing to a cloud service provider, you actually, as the data owner, you don't remove the, the responsibility. So you're still accountable. So if there is a, a breach, for example, um, yeah, you, you could be uh, charged, well, in fact, with the new regulations that are coming, they're talking about uh, making percentage charges of your annual turnover. So there's risk, there's definitely risk. But I'll say this, today you would have uh, insurance within your company, liability insurance, and actually if you were doing work on-premise or in the cloud, you would have exactly the same insurance. So it doesn't change. The only thing that changes is that somebody else is managing it and you're verifying those controls around the data. So, yeah, you, your, your liability is there today. Your liability with a SaaS provider would still be there tomorrow. Your insurance terms uh, may change a little bit, but it's still exactly uh, the same principle. Um, and then the question about trust. Um, so, I mean, you should be asking questions like, you know, what do you do with your log files? Are they in a central server? How do you avoid tampering? You know, all of the usual sorts of things, segregation of duties, you know, having to, to, to make changes to log files in multiple locations, uh, you know, in order to cover your tracks, which is obviously going to be difficult, keeping your logs for, you know, an extended period of time, 18 months or more, this sort of thing, um, as well as making sure that there is, um, in fact, you should have a... Uh, in the event of a breach, you should have a minimum level of requirements of what sort of uh, output you want from the cloud service provider. So what is the breach? What is the scale of it? What is the scope of it? Um, you know, a, a time frame on understanding what the, you know, what the issue is. You know, so they're dedicating resources to it, to making sure that they can then inform you what they think it is and what they're going to do to remediate. So those sorts of things. It's not, um, yeah, I don't think you can necessarily prevent totally uh, you know, things happening, but making sure then that you've got the appropriate things afterwards to deal with it, to give you a level of trust. And that's, that's doing the thinking in advance for the contract, I think. Shall I? Yeah. 
And again, so you've got the same, so if you take, I think, the new data, I think, I can't remember whether the new regulation is saying uh, within a, you know, an acceptable or short time frame, but it doesn't actually define. But you might want to ensure, again, contractually, that if there is a data breach that is known of, that you need notification within a 48-hour period. In fact, no, I think it's seven, is it 72 hours for certain uh, regulations. I know having done some contracts in this country, um, that there was a, 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 with the Dutch National Bank, uh, there was a requirement to report any data breach within 72 hours. And so I think written into the contracts, you'd want something from your provider that would be less. So I think, again, it's about understanding what your requirements are and then making sure that you can incorporate that into your contracts. And I think depending on, yeah, in fact, if a, if a cloud provider has done their job well from a compliance and legal perspective, they should have made sure that the generic design of their contracts is fit for most purposes. So it should, it should if they haven't specified the, num, you know, the amount of time to, to, to notify you of a breach, they should have a time that they could put in if, if, if they were able to because their process uh, supports it. Have I seen a, a service provider that gives different assurance levels? How to, how to rely on so this I would say, um, and actually this is a, an interesting nuance because if it's a true SaaS provider and it's a single code base and it's a multi-tenanted uh, solution, it shouldn't really be feasible to give different levels of assurance because it's all one. Now, you may find other providers that will say, we can give you general terms and conditions, uh, sorry, sorry, specific terms and conditions, and if you hear that, you must know that there's something not right, and then dig a little bit further, because it's probably, they're selling it as a multi-tenanted, and it actually isn't. That's, uh, I'm not familiar with that. But what I would say, so if you, uh, you're saying discrediting of uh, some of the bodies where we look for assurance, which I guess you could say the same with, um, yeah, uh, auditors, Anderson Consulting, or, you know, we get these events periodically, um, whether it's, you know, financial accounting or whether it's, uh, yeah, something like the trust. But, yeah, then you need to evolve your model and evolve what you're looking for. But I think the industry is still quite new, and it is evolving, and I think we will see new things coming. So, I mean, if you take SAS 70, they decided it was not fit for purpose because it was trying to be too many things to too many people, and then they split it off into the SOC 1 and the SOC 2, one for the financial reporting and one for the security controls. So I guess it's going to be an evolving landscape. It's going to continuously be evolving, which I guess is the cool thing about IT, really. It's, it's always evolving. Cool. Thank you for listening. <laughs>